Now from News 10 NBC, coverage you can count on. This is News 10 NBC at 5. All the teachers and students loved him. He was somebody that everybody could relate to and somebody he, who really was charming. One young man is dead, another charged with DWI following a deadly crash this weekend. I'm Janet Lomax. And I'm Rich Funky. Police say 20-year-old Brian Alvarez of Greece ran a red light on Lake Avenue early Sunday morning and struck a car with two men inside. 19-year-old Jaron Haygood was driving. 20-year-old Nathan Cooper of Rochester was a passenger in the vehicle and Cooper died. Ray Lovato is on Lake Avenue where the crash happened, Ray. Rich Janet, this is where it happened about 2.30 Sunday morning. The car that Cooper was riding in was making a left-hand turn into the tops in McDonald's parking lot. That's when police say a van driven by Brian Alvarez of Greece ran a red light and then slammed into their car. Alvarez is 20 and underage, and police have charged him with DWI. Surrounded by family and friends, Nathan Cooper's mother, Alicia, showed us her favorite picture of her son. I'm not used to my kids not being here. And it's hard when they go. It is. It's hard. Cooper and his friend, 20-year-old Jerron Haygood, who was driving the car, had been out dancing at clubs. They were hungry and decided to stop at the McDonald's on Lake Avenue to get something to eat. Police say the van plowed into their car broadside. Cooper's older brother says a witness came forward with information about the crash and the driver of the van. The guy said he didn't hesitate to slam on his brakes or anything. He out like he just kept going out like he, he wasn't they wasn't even there. It was like a like a, a, a arrow just hitting like a, a dummy target. Family members say Cooper graduated from Edison, but he also attended the young adult evening high school before starting at MCC. Two of his former high school teachers say he was a pleasant young man and a joy to have in the classroom. He was just somebody who lit up a room. He was a student who came in, everybody loved. He was a charming young man. Very hard worker, um, very focused. Um, always had um, something positive to contribute in class, and we miss him. Sunday night, Cooper's many friends lit candles and held a vigil for him at the scene of the fatal crash. That's just my boy, Nate. I miss him, love him, death. Nathan was the class clown, and um, he was always the one when you were down, he knew the right words to say to get you back on your feet. He always kept me going and like kept me laughing and kept a smile on my face and keep me from doing wrong. And I just love him. The young man driving the car that Cooper was in, his friend Jerron Haygood, I spoke with his step grandmother today and she said that he is still hospitalized with arm and neck, in neck injuries. Rich? Ray, will there be additional charges filed now? Well, police have not said anything about that. We've been calling them all day, but with a death involved in a DWI charge, the family is expecting, and I, I think hoping, that there will be additional charges filed. Ray Lovato reporting from Lake Avenue tonight. Thanks, Ray. And another tragic story developed over the weekend. A young girl found in a shallow grave, and police say it was her brother-in-law who killed her. Catherine Sanchez had been missing since mid-January. Late Friday, police found her body buried in an apple orchard near Albion, Orleans County. They learned about the location after the Border Patrol picked up Carlos Cardenas for being an illegal immigrant. Now he is charged with murder tonight. We spoke with his wife, who was also the victim's sister. And today, even though school is out, there were counselors ready to help classmates with their grief. That's where Berkeley Breen was today. Berkeley? Hi, Janet. Uh, by the time we got to Albion High School, about a dozen friends of Catherine were there already talking with counselors. And I talked with her principal and learned a lot more about Catherine Sanchez. The school says she was active in sports, clubs, and student government. Her principal told us that she wanted to be a teacher when she grew up. She was just 15 years old and in the 10th grade. She went missing back on January 14th. Police say her brother-in-law, Carlos Cardenas, sexually assaulted her, then strangled her in the basement of his home in Albion. They believe that he killed her the same day she disappeared. Police say he left her body in the basement for several days, then buried her in this apple orchard about 15 minutes away. Police discovered her body here on Friday. On Saturday, my colleague Ted Fiorliso spoke with Catherine's family, including Kimberly, her sister, and Carlos's wife. She says they did not report her missing for a week because Carlos convinced them not to call police. Like right after she went missing, you think? I was with him three years. I didn't think he was capable of doing that. He's sick. 
he's sick in his mind. He was, the whole week that she was gone, he was like, she's probably with the family. She's probably with a boyfriend. She probably ran away. And, and being there for me and just acting normal. He was sick in the head. He was demented. Carlos Cardenas is in court on Thursday. He's in jail right now on no bail. Catherine Sanchez's funeral is tomorrow evening in Albion. That's where she grew up. Coming up at 6, you're going to hear from uh, her principal and from her biological father. Now, he lives in North Dakota and barely speaks English, but through a translator, you're going to hear how he learned out about his daughter's death and the one fact that makes it even more painful for him. Janet? This is such a difficult story. Berkeley. You know, she goes missing January 14th. The police are called a week later. Was there any reason for not putting out a missing persons alert? Well, we asked police about that because we were curious, and they tell us, they told us on Sunday that they wanted to keep it quiet because Cardenas, in their words, was their suspect almost immediately. And because he is in the country illegally, they were worried that he was going to run away. And if he did, in their words, it would hinder their investigation. So that's their explanation for uh, not alerting us about a missing person. Berkeley Breen in our newsroom tonight. Thank you. Let's check the forecast now as we return to a February deep freeze. It's going to be a cold one. Kevin Williams joins us now from the Pinpoint 10 Weather Center. Yeah, it is. Uh, the normal temperatures this time of the day, this time of the year, Rich and Janet, mid-30s. Look at some numbers now. You see it's a far cry from that. It is just bone chilling. I mean, here we are a month from spring. It's spring officially a month from now and not to be found around these parts. We're live at Pittsburgh Sutherland. Uh, over uh, through Weatherbug at only 12 degrees. The high occurred early today at 22. That was the high. We continued to drop, and though the winds weren't strong, you have winds of 5 to 10 miles an hour, and that gets you some pretty low wind chills, as we'll take a look at momentarily. Some other numbers for you. Note the higher elevations are already single digits. Dundee, 8. Bristol Mountain at 4. Uh, so the warm spots, relatively speaking, are near the lake as that breeze comes in off the 33-degree lake water, modifying temperatures just a bit. And about that breeze, these occur in wind chills, 3 below Sodas Point, 6 below Bristol Mountain, 3 above over at McQuaid in Brighton. So it's cold, and we'll tell you how cold it's going to get in your town in our forecast. We'll also tell you when it's going to warm up, though a modest warm up at that, and when the next rounds of snow and stuff come our way. All that coming up just uh, in a few moments. Rich and Janet. Kevin, thank you. We're following breaking news at this hour out of California. These are live pictures from Crestline, California, that is near Los Angeles, where a bus carrying 20 to 25 teenagers went over the side of a mountain the California Highway Patrol is reporting at least two deaths right now. The bus may have collided with another vehicle and then struck a power pole before going off the side of the road and then down that embankment. Rescuers are working to get a number of trapped passengers out of the bus. And of course, we'll continue to follow this breaking story and bring you updates as we get them. She was killed in a car crash last month, and today the Nazareth College community paid tribute to Gabrielle Acevedo. That crash happened on French Road on January 22nd. Acevedo died February 4th. The tribute started about an hour ago at the Linehan Chapel on campus. Christine Van Timmeren talked with Acevedo's best friends today about how her death has affected the Nazareth community. Christine? Rich, it has been a tough few weeks for students at Nazareth. They lost such a rich and vibrant friend and classmate. But students we talked with said today isn't about all that sadness. It's about celebrating the life and legacy of Gabby. It was a packed house. And it was a packed house at Nazareth at their college chapel today. The tribute to Gabby was organized by some of her best friends. They say her death has changed them forever. Gabby's spirit and zest for life will live on through her memory. Since Gabby's funeral was held back in her hometown, today was a chance for the students and staff at Nazareth to honor this young woman's life. It's a life taken away from this campus, and it's a light gone. You know, she, she brought such a light to this campus that it was really difficult. It was a really difficult thing to experience at our young age. She was, she was a very young person, and she had so much life in her. Police say the driver of the car Gabby was riding in, Danielle Pitcher, is a junior at Nazareth, and Pitcher is being charged with a DWI and speeding. Well, calls tonight for Libya's Muammar Gaddafi to step down, and those calls are coming from his own deputy ambassador to the United Nations. More than 200 people have been killed in anti-government protests in Libya. And as each hour goes by, there are more reports trickling out of that country suggesting that that nation is essentially disintegrating, coming apart. 
There are still thousands of protesters in the streets of the capital and reports of senior government ministers and diplomats defecting. At this hour, it is unclear where Gaddafi is, but it is believed that he is still in that country. A Rochester mother who was falsely accused of child abuse has won a major victory in state Supreme Court. Her lawsuit against the manufacturers of Little Tummy's oral laxative drops, which was dismissed two years ago, can move forward now. Delirus Diaz sued the manufacturer after she gave the medication to her two and a half year old son. The toddler suffered severe burns to his rectal area. Doctors believe Diaz burned the baby with hot water and she was arrested in 2007. Well, the charges were dropped when authorities discovered the injuries were caused by an ingredient in that laxative. Today's ruling allows Diaz to recover monetary damages for the pain and suffering of her son and the harm done to her own reputation. It is a high stakes game of political chicken in Wisconsin, and it doesn't look like either side is backing down. Plus, taking care of your heart now may save your mind later in life. Those stories still ahead on News 10 NBC. The space shuttle Discovery will make its final flight this week. Today's launch countdown from Kennedy Space Center started this space afternoon at 3 o'clock. And with good weather in sight, liftoff scheduled for 4.50 on Thursday, 4.50 in the afternoon. The Discovery was originally scheduled to make its final voyage back in November, but it was grounded because of cracks in the fuel tank. The uh, shuttle's mission to deliver a storage module and other items to that space station. Uh, the Republican leader of the Wisconsin State Senate says there will be no vote on a bill taking away union rights for government workers until Democrats return. Those Democratic lawmakers skipped town last week to prevent Republicans from passing the governor's plan to effectively end collective bargaining for most public employees. Thousands of demonstrators rallied again today. Union leaders have indicated they are willing to make concessions, but Governor Scott Walker says he will not compromise on this. News 10 NBC continues to honor Black History Month by sharing some of the contributions made by local African Americans. And tonight, Rochester Police Captain Charles Charlie Price. Charles Price joined the Rochester Police Department in 1947, and when he put the uniform on, he became the first black person on the force. A little over a decade later, he made detective, then captain, the first African American to reach that rank. He served on several community boards, and Captain Price was active with the Kiwanis Club, elected the first black governor, New York State District. He retired from the Rochester Police Force in 1985. News 10 NBC honors Captain Charles Charlie Price. And tomorrow we honor Audrey Smith, who founded an organization that has helped hundreds of families impacted by crime. Well, we have been thrust back into the dead of winter, it yes, seems. Yes, we have. It <laughs> After is a couple of nice chilly days. Chilly out there. That's for sure. It's really cold. Kevin Williams tells us how long this for rigid spell is going to stay with us. It's up next. World events once again driving up the price at the pump here in Monroe County. They're awful. They're very high. And the experts say things could get worse before they get any better. We'll have a live report coming up. News 10 NBC and WYSL FM Talk 92.1 and News Power 1040, made possible by Netsman's Appliance. We're right next door in Webster. You're watching News 10 NBC, winner of the 2010 Edward R. Murrow Award for breaking news coverage. That's coverage you can count on. That's News 10 NBC. You know, I am really trying to be positive, but how much more of this do we have to endure? June. June? It'll be June. <laughs> Here's really. Kevin Williams. Well, I'm positive we have at least a few more weeks of this, uh, Jana Rich. I hope your weekend was a nice one. Good afternoon to all. Uh, interesting weekend. Boy, those snow squalls, those winds on Saturday, and then snow last night. Burying some areas, leaving others relatively unscathed. But, you know, we're in a big ski week. That President's Day, a very big ski day. So we're taking to Bristol Mountain. This is a live shot from the summit, uh, one of their theme trails here, theme parks and uh, uh, terrain parks. And you can see the uh, uh, folks are out there, not uh, uh, dissuaded from the Arctic chill. There are folks out there enjoying their time out on the summit there. But, boy, it is awfully, awfully cold. Four degrees now at the summit of Bristol Mountain. The high, kind of a meager, woeful high at that earlier in the day at 21. But temperatures dropping through the day. Just enough of a breeze to really uh, take your breath away as you're heading down some of those slopes, some of those expert trails in particular. So heads up on that for sure. Temperatures will moderate somewhat, but not tonight. 
Not so much tomorrow. We'll have to wait till Wednesday to get up closer to normal. Check out our live pinpoint and Doppler across the board. Nothing going on in terms of any significance. So we do expect some flurries. There are a couple light ones out there, and they'll pick up a little bit overnight into tomorrow. But the storm system that brought snow last night has passed a really this distinct north to south gradient. Very little accumulation on the lakeshore. As you work south across the area, the mountains did pick up six inches in Dansville, five and 20 quarter, four inches in Geneva, Brockport at three, Newark at three inches. Uh, so just adding to our snowpack. We'll have some other numbers at 530 for you. Being pretty impressed by where we stand for official tallies here in Rochester. So we look ahead and we see more frigid air, more lake flakes tonight into tomorrow morning. But bright sunshine Wednesday should take the edge off the chill. Then a storm system comes in late week with some messiness, snow, ice and rain, and then more cold air for the weekend, more snow on Sunday. And it, on, and on it goes. 14 degrees in Rochester now. That wind out of the east, northeast of 10. It's kind of a raw wind. It just, just cuts to the bone. So it's a good night to stay home, have some warm soup and get the fire going and enjoy your time inside perhaps. The next, another system we're watching here, uh, a second piece of energy. Most of that energy is going to track into Pennsylvania, but importantly, it opens the door to that flow of frigid air, which will have us in its icy clench right through the night into the day tomorrow. How about those numbers? 7 a.m. For those of you viewing us in Naples, it's the loneliest number. One degree to start today. Some sub-zero readings to be sure. Not as cold lakeside due to the modification of that 33 degree lake water. We're in the teens tomorrow. That's the best we'll do for the most part. Might briefly touch 20, but we do a little better on Wednesday. We make a run of 30 then. We drop tonight to 10 lakeside, zero well south, six in Rochester at the airport with some flurries developing, maybe a dusting. We're up to 20 in town tomorrow morning. Flurries and clouds break for sunshine. But again, a bitter day, especially with that breeze out of the north. Here's your seven-day weekend always in view. Not as cold Wednesday, abundant sunshine, 32. A messy mix of snow, ice, and rain moves in late Thursday and 40. Occasional snow, a little freezing drizzle Friday, 32. Colder for the weekend, some sun Saturday, and then some snow moving in for Sunday into Monday of next week, guys. Kevin, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Well, new research suggests that you can prevent memory loss by taking care of your heart. We'll explain that next in medical news. Plus, a female news photographer was attacked outside an IHOP restaurant. The camera kept rolling until a reporter and police rescued her. That's coming up. In medical news tonight, high blood pressure doesn't just raise a red flag for heart disease. Hypertension could also signal the possibility of early memory loss. French researchers followed thousands of adults in their 50s for a decade. Those who had typical cardiovascular risk factors like higher blood pressure and cholesterol levels were more likely to lose their memory earlier and at a faster rate. The exact link is not clear, but cardiologists aren't surprised. It's probably an inflammation, an irritation of the lining of many of our arteries, the linings of our arteries to our head, to our hearts, to our colon. Now experts say you can cut your risk for heart disease and memory loss with four lifestyle changes. Don't smoke, stay at a healthy weight, exercise vigorously at least three times a week, and eat at least five fruits or vegetables every day. Doctors estimate that just 3% of the population consistently listens to that advice. Also in medical news tonight, a new study finds knowing a second language may protect against the effects of Alzheimer's disease. Canadian researchers tested about 450 Alzheimer's patients, half of whom were bilingual. All patients had similar levels of cognitive impairment, but those who were bilingual had been diagnosed an average of four years after those who spoke only one language. Researchers believe it's because bilingual people exercise a specific brain network more often, allowing them to better cope with the effects of Alzheimer's. Now, if you don't speak another language, it's not too late. Research shows the same benefit in those who take up a foreign language later in life. We? We. We. French. Oh, I thought you meant us. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. okay. Keep going. Let <laughs> well, that joins us now with a preview of a story she's working on. Oh boy, okay. Well, do you or your children really know what President's Day is all about? Personally, I just. I think it's a wasted holiday. I mean, I understand it's the president's birthday, but I don't understand why the banks and the post office and all that could be closed. We found some interesting answers. Our President's Day trivia next on News 10 NBC. News 10 NBC is brought to you by Honda. Come see what's new for 2011 at your Honda dealer. 
and like all holidays, it's supposed to be focusing on the meaning of the holiday and not so much like the day off and shopping. But that's what some people in our area say President's Day has become, a day of shopping and sales, not a day to celebrate the men who helped shape our nation. President's Day was originally two holidays honoring the birthdays of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. But all of that changed in the 1960s when President Richard Nixon combined both birthdays to create the one holiday. Well, new at 530, Lynette Adams has our President's Day trivia and takes a look at what our community knows about this holiday. Well, we thought what better place to find out what people know and what they think of this important American holiday than at the mall. Here's what we heard. Ladies and gentlemen, President Tim Chisula. At the depths of the Great Depression, President Roosevelt announced... Humorous commercials, spoofs of the presidents themselves, promising sales and deals. Across America, this is what we typically see on President's Day. So how do Americans view this holiday? We found out some people don't even know who we're honoring. Presidents, they replaced two holidays for two other presidents. Do you know which ones? Uh, Washington, and I have no idea who else. <laughs> we don't really learn about anything really in school about President's Day at all. Tiffany, tell me whose birthday is this today that we're celebrating? Uh, the president's. I don't know which one. Some people question this holiday. Okay, George Washington's the first president, I understand, but I think it's a wasted holiday. Wasted on two American giants? President Lincoln actually came here to Rochester. In fact, it was on this very spot that he spoke to 15,000 Rochesterians. That was February the 18th, 1861. He was on his way to Washington, D.C. to his own inauguration as America's 16th president. I think Washington, because he was the first and was so critically important in the revolutionary times, and Lincoln, of course, because of what he did for the country and moving race relations forward and ending slavery. For those who know the meaning of this day, they wonder if it's lost on today's generation. It's just another day off for him to, you know, hang out with friends, sleep late. Uh, not have school, basically. Or just lost. Happy birthday to you! Tell me whose birthday are we celebrating today? <laughs> um, no, President. President Obama. President's Day has now become a day to honor all of America's presidents and falls each year on the third Monday of February between Lincoln and Washington's birthday. And Rich and Janet, I have a question for you. Who is your favorite American president or who do you think deserves a holiday? Which president? Well, I think two that rank consistently rank among the highest, most popular would be FDR and Reagan. So I don't know. Well, I, I think Kennedy's up there too, but my suggestion is that we have a holiday for each of the presidents and then that way we'd have about 40 holidays. Oh, that sounds good. 40, 40 more holidays, that individual days. And I'm how many you, of JFK. them would we get off? <laughs> None. <laughs> That's right. And you? you like JFK. JFK. Yeah. JFK. All right. Lynette, thank you very much. Thanks, Lynette. You uh, no doubt have noticed the unrest in the Middle East is sending gasoline prices up again. According to AAA, the national average for a gallon of regular is 317 in Rochester. The average is 334. Uh, that is uh, up almost 50 cents from a year ago at this time. And the experts are telling Pat McGonigal that prices will likely go up even more before they come back down again. He joins us live from the mobile station at 12 Corners in Brighton with that story. Pat. Yeah, Rich, nobody wants to hear that gas prices will go up even more, but sadly, that is exactly what the industry insiders are telling us tonight. In fact, how about this? Are you ready for this? By Memorial Day, we could see $4 a gallon once again. Now, today, we talked with Bill Adams. He is the president of the New York State Association of Service Stations and Repair Shops, and he says the price hikes we're seeing right now in gas are all just overreactions by speculators in the commodities market. At this moment, despite everything that's happened in the Middle East so far, there has been no disruption at all in oil delivery anywhere, but prices are creeping up because there's fear that things will get more complicated. I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. I think you're going to see the $4, $4 gallon price here from probably within the next few months. By summer? By summer. 
Now, Bill Adams was telling me that he has some friends who are already making plans for $4 a gallon this summer. He has a friend with a boat. He's saying that boat won't get out of storage. Many people will probably adjust their summer travel plans, maybe stick closer to their home. And just like we saw in 2008, transportation budgets will get turned upside down. Everything from school districts to supermarkets. Rich? It's, it's a tough thing, and you know, we talk about this all the time whenever we do this story, but it's worth mentioning again why gas prices are consistently 10 or 20 cents higher in Rochester or in New York State than the national average. Yeah, that's right, Rich, and the short answer is taxes. Think of it this way. When you pay about three thirty a gallon here in Monroe County, 65 cents of that goes straight to taxes, and when you're filling up here in Monroe County, you're getting taxed 10 different ways. Everything from the Superfund recovery fee to state excise taxes. 10 different ways, Rich. All right, Pat McGonigal reporting live from Brighton tonight. Thanks, Pat. Well, remember that game show Supermarket Sweep where people go racing down the aisle. They try to grab as many groceries as they can. Well, that was the scene today at the Tops Friendly Market in Parenton, and it was all for a good cause. Nikki Rudd has the story. Three, two, one. The Shikanskis had just five minutes to fly down these aisles and fill their carts. He said the chief meat. Meat. What meat? You get everything seafood? From seafood to sloppy joes. I got you sloppy joe. This couple had some shopping spree skills. How about Eric with that double card action? Well, we had a strategy, but it kind of went all crazy. <laughs> At first, we did exactly what we were going to do. Then everyone's telling us, hey, you got this here, and you get that there, so. All right, now load them up. But this wasn't just about the groceries. It's all for the Golisano Children's Hospital. Their son, Bryce Shoskansky, is a patient there. We just got to go and support this hospital. We have to support the place who's helped him and so many other children. We visited Bryce at the hospital a few years back. He gets weekly treatments that last eight hours for an incurable enzyme deficiency. Tops donated the shopping spree for the Golisano Children's Hospital's gala to show their support. They've been the, one of the biggest supporters and they've just become our second family as well as Strom Memorial Hospital. While mom and dad shopped till they dropped, literally, Bryce had one thing on his mind. Get what you want? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite item that they got? Cheese dip. And when they tallied it all up, the Shikanskis went home with nearly $4,200 worth of groceries, all for a good cause. The hospital is just the most wonderful place we could ever imagine, and um, we're, we're glad to help them. And it took a caravan of carts to haul it all away. In Parenton, Nikki Rudd, News 10, NBC. They did a little grocery shop in there, didn't so they? Did. They paid $3,000 for that shopping spree. All that money will go to medical research at Golisano Children's Hospital. They they did a good thing there. They're, they're a great family, yeah. and my understanding is that some of the food that they collected today was going to go over to the hospital as well for the kids. So Perfect. We say, we say thank you. Yeah. Well, an $80,000 bike, a $600,000 car, <laughs> coming up, another sign that the economy might be bouncing back. Plus, the kids have the uh, week off from school for this February recess, but uh, have you decided where you're going for spring break? 29% of travelers told us that they want to hit the beach this spring. Still ahead, your spring break hotspots. News 10 NBC closed captioning is brought to you by Advantage Federal Credit Union's low rate visa. No balance transfer fees, no cash advance fees. A group of angry mourners were apparently offended when a Sacramento news crew tried to get too close to a memorial that was being set up outside a pancake restaurant. Here you can see the mourners forcing the reporter and the camera person back. They punched the woman, knocked both of them to the ground. The memorial was to honor the life of a 27-year-old who was killed in the parking lot of that IHOP about 12 hours earlier. The news crew apparently suffered cuts and bruises in the incident, but uh, neither is seriously injured. Well, well-to-do Americans apparently are buying again. As the nation emerges from its worst recession since the Great Depression, the wealthy are opening their wallets. Here are a couple of upscale items being offered by high-end retailers. Steinway has a John Lennon-themed piano for 90 grand. German bike maker PG has a battery-powered bike for $80,000. And Porsche is out with a new hybrid for $600,000. Moody says the country's wealthiest 5% of homes account for about 37% of all consumer spending. $600,000 for a car? Wow. 
Well, the stock market closed today in honor of President's Day. Coming up, it's a popular trend that many hockey families are buying into. We don't have a swimming pool, so we're the family that has the ice rink. Sports director Robin Wynn tells us why more families are making this backyard investment. And we're going to have that sledding forecast for a hill near you. The complete seven-day outlook is straight ahead. Dorschel.com is proud to sponsor News 10 NBC's Pinpoint 10 Weatherbug Network with live cameras and up-to-the-minute weather conditions from across our area. News 10 NBC Pinpoint 10 weather. weather coverage you can count on. For all those kids who have the week off, it's going to get better. Yeah, I mean, you want them out of the house, right? <laughs> oh, God. You want them to have fun. Oh, yeah, for the really, parents, I should really say. really too cold out there right now. Yeah, it's bitter. Brutal night. You really have to be a diehard to be out there skiing tonight. But it will get better. It's not going to get warm, per se, or mild. We'll just get less chilly over the next uh, couple of days. So that'll make it a little more tolerable for getting out. And really, it is a pretty time of year with fresh snow and the sun coming out. It can be very nice indeed. And that is where we're heading over the next couple of days. For those who are interested in heading to the sledding hills, we've had fresh powder anywhere from one to six inches from north to south across the area overnight and earlier this morning. The sun returns tomorrow afternoon, but the cold lingers. Wednesday is your better day. It'll be sunny all day and temperatures then will uh, moderate into the 20s and low 30s. So something to look forward to then. In the meantime, boy, is this a midwinter view or not? I mean, it's, it's dark, it's cold, there is a breeze. We've got ice covering here the northern tip of Canada. would like to view live data courtesy of Sager Marine and our partner visit FingerLakes.com and Weatherbug. Of course, these are the boat slips, which will be populated someday by uh, some, some boats, but not anytime soon, although you know it's going to be officially spring one month. Uh, from today. So something to uh, perhaps uh, look forward to. In the meantime, it is cold across the board. The current number in Canandaigua is only 10 degrees and that breeze sometimes uh, gusty, mostly light, but when you get this cold, even a slight breeze kind of cuts right through you and that's what we have ongoing tonight. But in terms of precipitation, nothing going on to speak of. We do expect some flurries to develop overnight, but it's a pretty much a dry scan right now. How about that snowfall? We've crossed the 100 inch plateau over the weekend. If it didn't snow, Another flake in Rochester for the rest of winter. We'd have an inch above the normal for an entire winter. Syracuse closing in on 150 inches. Really been a remarkable winter from coast to coast, and it is not over, not by a long shot. The next system coming through will be missing us south through Pennsylvania, but it allows the cold air to drain in. That's why our temperatures tonight, away from the modifying influence of the cities and lakes, will drop towards zero tonight. Even those skies will be kind of cloudy with a few flurries out and about. But those flurries should not at least amount to much. So lots of shivering, not much shoveling. In fact, tomorrow morning, lots of clouds. And embedded in these clouds will be some lake flurries coming in off the big lake. But they clear away. The sun should come out. If not by late morning, then we do expect by afternoon the sun is shining. Doesn't do much for the temperature, but it does help uh, lift your spirits at least. And that's a good trend, I think, by Wednesday. Temperatures do begin to rebound. So it's a frigid night tonight, a three-blanket night. Bring the pooch in. Again, it's, a, it's that kind of night. We dropped to 10 lakeside, six officially in Rochester, and zero uh, to the south with, again, some patchy clouds and lake flurries. 20, your top temp tomorrow, but we spend be the better part of the day in the teens. Morning flurried clouds will give way to sunshine. And again, there is that stiff, biting, bitter breeze in off the lake. Here's your seven-day weekend always in view. Wednesday starts frigid, but it's better. Bright sun, not much wind. That's the day, if you're thinking to do the sledding and the skiing and the skating, it looks sharp. But Thursday, some stuff moves in late. Snow, ice, and rain. Some snow on Friday. And the weekend is cold Saturday, some more snow on Sunday, and there may be a really potent storm watch uh, waiting in the wings around long about Tuesday or Wednesday. So uh, mm -hmm. still plenty of winter weather to track, and we'll do just that. Okay. Kevin, yeah. thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Well, the kids are home from school for the week, and yes, a lot of them just are itching to go ice skating. Many in their own backyards, and it's good ice-making weather, that's for <laughs> sure. Robin Duen joins us now and tells us about a trend many hockey families are buying into. Yeah, you can see it more when you're driving around. Families invest in swimming pools and basketball hoops. Now more are choosing to build backyard skating rinks. Ice time can be expensive, so having a rink at home is proving to be a popular option for kids who want some winter exercise and to improve their hockey skills. I usually watch Sabres with my dad, so that got me got interested. Abby Weltman has been playing hockey for four years. She enjoys her team, but it's the backyard time with her brother and sister that helped perfect her game. I've been practicing shooting with the puck, so that's helping out during practices and games. Ice ranks are popping up in backyards all over. The reason seems to be the same. We don't have a swimming pool, so 
or the family that has the ice rink, and it's it's actually easy. It's easy to have. It's more to maintain than anything, but thought it would be great for the kids and their skills. Seven-year-old Andrew likes having the private space he doesn't get during a team practice. It's cool. We like almost skate every day and shoot and goals. <laughs> Tony Audie is a Webster youth hockey coach. I would say probably about uh, a quarter to a third of the team will typically have uh, a rink in their backyard. So it was an easy decision for him to invest in a backyard skating rink for his three kids. He says materials cost about $500. The plastic liner is usually replaced after each season. That's about $150. There's a lot of kids playing youth hockey these days. They want to get extra ice time. You know, ice time is expensive. Um, and it's a good way for them to be able to develop their skills at home. And it's a good way for kids of all skill levels to get added practice together. Taylor Quinton is with the Rochester Edge. She has her own rink but likes playing with her friends. When you're in the backyard, you can always practice and um, just practice all the things you can't do um, on the, uh, in the rink. Like every single night, maybe twice a night, and uh, once I finish my homework. Families like the Weltman say the investment is worth it. No Zamboni is required, just a little labor of love. I do most of the maintenance, <laughs> but he'll say he helps build it. <laughs> They're out here every day. We come out and skate. Um, we have friends over to skate, so it's a great way to get out in the wintertime and enjoy the cold weather. We called around to different home improvement stores and talked with store managers who say there has been an increase over the past several years of people coming in for the wood, for the lights, and all the other materials that go along with these skating rinks. How-to kits are also available on the Internet in a popular way, but I think really the best way is to have somebody handy that knows how to do this. And like you said, you need mom or dad out there to shovel, and away you go. You don't yeah, need to go anywhere. Teach the kids how to shovel. Yeah. <laughs> Get them out there. Water it. Get maintenance. Do the whole deal, right? Yes. Yeah. So we've had such a, a, a cold, cold oh, winter that, that this has really been, uh, the, most of the rinks started going up at Thanksgiving time so very popular yeah. Robin thanks. thanks Robin well it has been a rough winter really all over the country and that really has a lot of people thinking spring break but if you're making those plans prepare yourself prices have gone way up we'll tell you why next on News 10 NBC News 10 NBC spin point 10 weather bug network has been brought to you by doorshow.com now's the time to finalize those travel plans for spring break but before you do brace yourself for a little sticker shock chris clackham explains the traditional hot spots for the traditional spring breakers aren't changing this year although there may be more of both driving up the cost of getting and staying there you should expect there to be more crowds and those crowds to make prices higher the price of gasoline, airline tickets, hotel rooms are all up considerably headed into this spring break compared to last year's, but it doesn't look like that's going to make much difference. 29% of travelers told us that they want to hit the beach this spring. They're looking for that warm beach destination, followed by 25% of travelers who said they were interested in taking a cruise. Orlando's the number one spring break destination in an orbit survey, and AOL's travel experts say all of Florida should be busy. Florida is particularly strong for people in the Northeast, uh, in the Midwest, and as you would expect, in the southern part of the country. But spring break isn't just for the college crowd anymore, although older adults are often looking elsewhere. When you look at people who are really 35 and over, less than 10% of them say that they're specifically picking a destination that attracts that spring break crowd. After a winter of widespread discontent, some are getting a jump on spring break, Starting this coming weekend, Chris Clacken, NBC News. Well, all it takes is one great idea to help people in need and inspire others to do the same. And school leaders say an eighth grader had it, and she's our Do the Right Thing award winner tonight. Her name is Emily Buckbender. She got an idea to organize a goods drive. She then told her principal at Joanna Perrin Middle School in Fairport, and the entire school got involved. In all, they collected more than 3,500 items, including food, clothing, and toys for the holiday last year. I really just wanted, because I understood how in the situation they were in, and they were really in need, so I just wanted to try and help out. Well, the items were given to families at Wilson Commencement Park, and we say congratulations and keep up as a good work. Excellent, indeed. News to NBC continues in just a few moments. Here's Berkeley Breen with what's coming up at 6. Berkeley. Rich and Janet, a 15-year-old girl is assaulted, murdered, and buried. And police say her brother-in-law did it. I didn't think he was capable of doing that. He's sick. He's sick in his mind. 
Who was Catherine Sanchez, and why did her biological father not even know she was missing for a month? We answer those questions at 6. Now, from News 10 NBC, coverage you can count on. This is News 10 NBC at 6. He's upset because they didn't call him right away. Why did they wait so long? Questions remain surrounding the death of an Albion teenager. The 15-year-old was murdered and her brother-in-law is facing charges. I didn't think he was capable of doing that. He's sick. He's sick in his mind. Albion school leaders say the girl was an active student who loved school. I'm Rich Funky. I'm Janet Lomax. The body of 15-year-old Catherine Sanchez was found on Friday. Officers say she had been missing for more than a month. Sanchez's brother-in-law, Carlos Cardenas, has been charged with murder in this case. Investigators believe that he killed Sanchez, then buried her in a shallow grave in an apple orchard near Albion. Berkeley Breen has been tracking this story. He spoke with Sanchez's biological father, who says he didn't even know she was missing. Berkeley? Yeah, Janet, to the first time that her biological father heard she was missing was last week, just days before Catherine Sanchez's body was found. Now, he lives in North Dakota and did not have a particularly close relationship with his daughter. He did not have custody of her. But he says he still should have been told that she was missing. Ricardo Sanchez does not speak uh, English at all, so his thoughts are translated by his fiance. He's upset because they didn't call him right away. Why did they wait so long? So he had no idea that his daughter was missing? Nope. The last time Catherine Sanchez saw her father, she was three. He wasn't told that she was missing for nearly a month. Police came to his door with worse news Friday night. And what did they say? Uh, they put their heart down and told Ricardo we got bad news. And then what did they say? They said that they found her dead. This is the apple orchard where Catherine Sanchez's body was found. Now, police tell us that the, the suspect used to work here very recently. Police say Carlos Cardenas raped his sister-in-law, then strangled her inside his home in Albion. Police say he left the body in the basement for several days, then buried Catherine in the orchard. Kimberly Cardenas is Carlos's wife and Catherine's sister. I didn't think he was capable of doing that. He's sick. He's sick in his mind. Kimberly and her family did not report Catherine missing for a week. And she blames her husband for that. The whole week that she was gone, he was like, she's probably with the family. She's probably with a boyfriend. She probably ran away. And, and being there for me and just acting normal. Today at the high school, counselors were there for Catherine's friends. And that includes her principal. She got the terrible phone call Saturday night. Shock. Um, because you want to believe that the, the worst thing that could happen hasn't happened. So it was a shock. Her principal uh, says Catherine uh, played sports at Albion High School and was involved in student government, and she loved school so much that she wanted to be a teacher. Rich and Janet. A terrible story. What, yeah. what about the uh, brother-in-law now? What's his status? But he's still in jail in Orleans County and with no bail, and he's due back in court on Thursday. Now, he is considered an illegal immigrant. In fact, he was first arrested by the U.S. Border Patrol, and Catherine's body was discovered shortly after that. Police told us they considered decarting us a suspect shortly after they learned that uh, Catherine was missing. Berkeley Breen, thank you for our report tonight. One young man killed in a crash, another charged in connection with his death tonight. Officers say 20-year-old Brian Alvarez was driving drunk when he crashed into another vehicle early Sunday morning. He has now been charged with DWI. A passenger in the other car, 20-year-old Nathan Cooper, was killed. The driver, 19-year-old Jerron Haygood, was injured. Ray Lovato spoke with Cooper's family uh, today, and he joins us live from Lake Avenue where this crash took place. Ray? Yeah, Janet, this is the intersection where it happened. The car that Nathan Cooper was riding in was making a left-hand turn right here in the Topps McDonald's parking lot, and according to police, the light turned to red, and their car was broadsided by a northbound van that ran the red light. Nathan Cooper was in the front passenger seat at the time of the crash, and he was pronounced dead a short time later at Strong. His friend, the driver, Jerron Haygood, is still hospitalized with arm and neck injuries. The driver of the van, we're told, suffered minor injuries. Last night, friends of the two young men gathered and held a vigil here at the scene. They lit candles and left heartfelt messages. 
Nathan Cooper's family gathered with friends at their Francis Street home today in the city, and that's where we spoke with his mother and his former teachers. I'm not used to all my kids not being here. And it's hard when they go. It is. It's hard. He was just somebody who lit up a room. He was a student who came in, everybody loved. He was a charming young man who was very well spoken, very never a problem. Discipline, academically, behavior. He was always on honor roll, high honor roll. Nathan Cooper graduated from Edison and defied the odds facing many young African-American men in Rochester. He decided to attend the young adult evening high school program and he had just started Janet at MCC. So he had his whole future in front of him. So these young men were out, they were friends and uh, what were they doing at that point? Well, his brother, uh, James Coleman, said that Cooper and his friend, uh, Jerron Haygood, were had been out clubbing it and uh, they were hungry so they decided to stop into the McDonald's to get something to eat and that's why they were here the wrong place at the wrong time apparently the driver of the van is still just charged with DWI and the family was expecting maybe additional charges we tried to find out today and and, and there are no charges at this time such a sad story Ray Lovato thank you Right now, GOP leaders in the 26th district are meeting to decide who they will nominate to fill former Congressman Chris Lee's seat. The Republicans are holding a final vote in Geneseo. They met with potential candidates in Batavia yesterday. One of them, Kathy Wepner, who's a radio talk show host in Buffalo, came for an interview. Chris Lee served the 26th congressional district, which covers parts of Monroe County, including Greece. He resigned from his seat earlier this month, just hours after this photo of him bare-chested surfaced online. Lee, who is married, reportedly sent the picture to a woman who had posted an ad on Craigslist. A victory tonight for a Rochester mother who was wrongly accused of abusing her young son. Uh, the state Supreme Court ruled in favor of Delirus Diaz and reinstated her lawsuit against a laxative manufacturer. Now, she filed suit after she was arrested back in 2007, accused of scalding her son with hot water. Diaz called 911 when she discovered severe burns while changing the baby's diaper. Doctors believe the child was neglected and Diaz was charged with child abuse and then separated from both of her children. Well, it turns out she had given him drops of a laxative called Little Tummies, which investigators later found caused the burns. The court now says Diaz can collect for damages. Well, prepare for another frigid night. Meteorologist Kevin Williams joins us with a first look at the Pinpoint 10 forecast. Actually, much colder than last night, uh, Rich and Janet. So, I mean, it, it, is just, it is just bitter out there across the board. No one escaping uh, the chill in this go around. Here's a live shot of uh, cloudy skies over Metro Rochester from our Pinpoint 10 weather book camera. High atop the first federal plaza. Current temperatures are in view now. And boy, it is cold. Only 11 in Brockport, 7 Dundee, 4 at the summit of Bristol Mountain. And these are the wind chills right now, in some cases sub-zero, 2 below in Avon. I'll be back in a few minutes. We'll tell you how low it's going to go, the mercury that is in your town. We've got a 70 forecast, too, which does include some more snow down the road. Stay tuned. Those details are straight ahead. Rich and Jenna. Kevin, thank you. Unrest in the Middle East impacting our bottom line. Have you noticed the spike in gas prices? What am I going to do? you got to pay for it. you got to drive that car. So. Straight ahead, oil industry experts say we could see $4 a gallon by Memorial Day. Hey, have you seen it? Rock City Tonight. It's about Rochester. It's about you. Rock City Tonight. It's what you need to know and what you've got to see. I'll bring you the top stories of the day, the hottest stories on the web, and the most talked about videos. And if it's tweet worthy or buzz worthy, we've got it. Rock City Tonight. It's about Rochester. It's about you. Rock City Tonight with Leah Lando. Weeknights at 7 on News 10 NBC. Students and staff at Nazareth College paid tribute to Gabriel Acevedo today. Acevedo suffered severe injuries in a crash on French Road January 22nd and died February 4th. The chapel at Nazareth was packed with students and staff. The tribute to Gabby was organized by some of her best friends. They say her death has changed them forever and that Gabby's spirit will live on through her memory. We know that we were blessed to have her in our lives for the time that we had and, and that's what we are thankful for and that's what we're celebrating today because we, we got to know Gabby and we had her in our life. I think today people will realize that, you know, she's not like she's physically gone but her spirit's still around so 
I think that will help move everybody's pain throughout the rest of the school year. The Acevedo family is from downstate. Gabby's father and brother attended today's tribute. Officers have arrested a man they say led them on a high speed chase. A police say 24 year old Brian Vega robbed a bank in Webster on Saturday and then investigators say the next day they spotted Vega in a car on Lake Avenue in Rochester. When they tried to pull him over, they claim he sped off in that vehicle. Police say he then lost control of his car, jumped out and ran away. He was taken into custody, though, a short while later. Well, if you drive a car, you've got to fill it up, and you know gas prices are on the rise, and it could get a whole lot worse. We could see $4 a gallon by this summer. At least that's what some believe. Over the past two weeks, the average price of regular in the U.S. has jumped more than a nickel. The national average now stands at $3.17. The average in Monroe County, $3.38. Three having to do with our higher taxes in New York. Experts say it has everything to do with the recent unrest in the Middle East. Just the fear of the disruption of uh, uh, oil flow is causing the gas prices to rise. Uh, there's plenty of supply on hand right now, but unfortunately the, uh, the markets are reacting in a negative way for the consumer and the price of gas is going up. The cheapest gas in the country is in Billings, Montana at $2.95 a gallon. The highest, San Francisco, $3.54 a gallon. News to NBC is celebrating Black History Month by highlighting the contributions of local African Americans. And tonight we honor Captain Charles Price. Charles Price joined the Rochester Police Department in 1947. And when he put the uniform on, he became the first black person on the force. A little over a decade later, he made detective, then captain, the first African American to reach that rank. He served on several community boards and Captain Price was active with the Kiwanis Club elected the first black governor, New York State District. He retired from the Rochester Police Force in 1985. News 10 NBC honors Captain Charles Charlie Price. And tomorrow we recognize Audrey Smith, a woman who's provided a shoulder to lean on for hundreds of families affected by crime. Well, we had a short break, but winter's back. Kevin Williams will uh, join us in just a couple of minutes to tell us how cold it's going to get tonight and when it's going to warm up again. It's all coming up. Now, weather coverage you can count on. Here's Kevin Williams with your Pinpoint 10 seven-day forecast. And a good evening, and uh, we're back to uh, work, for some of us at least, after a, a wintry spell. The three-day snowfall tallies in our region since uh, Friday night, Saturday morning. Uh, more than a foot in parts of the Finger Lakes and in Metro Rochester, not as much, but our seasonal tally is now at 102 inches. We average 101 for a whole winter, and we still have a month left to official winter, and likely more than that, uh, meteorologically speaking. So, boy, it's been quite the winter, and we've got some more uh, to tell you about. First, in terms of the snow today, heavier south of Rochester, here is the view from our Pinpoint 10 weather bug camera on the Esperanza Mansion site, looking at the west branch of beautiful Cuca Lake. Uh, where the snow clouds were departing, but this area picked up several inches of snow last night and early today. Everybody very much in on the cold. Single digit territory now in Branchport, currently 9 degrees. The winds are down, but even a light breeze like that uh, can kind of cut right through you. So a bitter, bitter night is ahead, and tomorrow looks pretty cold as well. Let's talk about the pattern. Winter rules for now. Frigid air with developing lake flurries overnight tonight into tomorrow morning. Shouldn't amount to much. It looks like a bright sunny day Wednesday. That should take the edge off the chill. A fast moving disturbance brings in some messy weather late week. There's another due on Sunday, still another next Tuesday with plenty of Arctic air to be tapped throughout. So a very active pattern and certainly in the short term, a very cold one as well. 14 degrees officially at the airport. Uh, the wind coming in from the east northeast. It is a raw cold breeze. Just a bitter night tonight. Good night to snuggle up by the fire and stay toasty warm. These are some snowfall tallies from the overnight system near the lake, not much, about an inch of snow fell. As you work farther south, the amounts did increase to about half a foot in the uh, southern sections of the Bristol Hills uh, into the higher terrain of southern Livingston County, Austin, picking up six and a half inches of snow. So we've got a solid snowpack redeveloped after that big meltdown late last week. So the system is moving away. A second disturbance will bring more snow to Pennsylvania tonight. It will not get us. We'll get the lake flurries, but it will facilitate, again, this cold blast that sends our temperatures tumbling all the way to zero and in some cases below. This is just before daybreak tomorrow. A bitter, bitter night. Only the 33 degree lake water modifies the lakeshore areas, keeping temperatures from getting below 10 there. And despite clouds that give way to uh, sunshine, not going to do much in the old temperature department tomorrow. We'll be lucky to have 20. We're in the teens, the better part of the day. Wednesday starts frigid, but with more sun, 
we should uh, get closer to 30, which would put us just a few degrees below the norm. So a nose-numbing night tonight. We dropped to 10 lakeside. Six officially is the call at the airport. Zero in the outlying areas to the south with developing lake flurries. Tomorrow, 20 morning clouds and flurries break for bright sunshine. But again, 20 degrees with a stiff breeze off the lake. Another day to bundle up big time. Here's your seven day. Weekend always in view. Wednesday will be the best day of the work week for getting out and playing if you're so inclined, the skiing and skating and sledding. Bright sun, not much wind, 32. Snow, sleet, and rain moving in late Thursday. Some snow and freezing drizzle on Friday. And then again, another system comes in on Sunday. So an active pattern and a cold one. Yeah, Kevin, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Well, what would you do if you were given five minutes inside a grocery store to grab whatever you wanted? All right, now load them up, load them up. <laughs> Straight ahead, we'll tell you how one Fairport couple did during their shopping spree. It is winter recess, and that means kids are out of school this week, but the February break isn't keeping some from learning some new lessons. We found several kids today at the Rochester Museum and Science Center exploring the past, present, and future with uh, some space travel. The museum expects to have more than 1,000 visitors this week alone. Well, the kids are off from school to uh, honor President's Day today, but how many people actually know the meaning of this holiday? Some people say the meaning has been lost in all the... Commercialism from TV ads to mall signs promoting President's Day sales. The day is supposed to celebrate the birthdays and the accomplishments of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln and all the presidents for that matter. We wanted to know if people knew that. Which presidents it honors? No. <laughs> the founding fathers, maybe? I don't know. The two presidents that this birthday it was in honor of originally. I don't know. I'm not for this contract. Well, no. he wouldn't know. Um, this is embarrassing for me. Um, uh, our, I'm going to say Washington, okay, and I'm going to say Lincoln. While this day was originally set aside in honor of Lincoln <laughs> and Washington, a new Gallup poll out says most Americans consider our greatest president to be Ronald Reagan. Well, they had five minutes and they had a strategy from sloppy joes to seafood. A couple in Fairport given free range at one local grocery store today. Yes, Eric and Cheryl Shakansky were the winners of a five minute shopping spree at Tops in Parenton. In October, they placed the winning bid for the prize at the gala for the Galasano Children's Hospital. Their son Bryce uh, receives weekly treatments there. We spoke with the family about their strategy. We had a strategy, but it kind of went all crazy. <laughs> At first, we did exactly what we were going to do. Then everyone's telling us, hey, you got this here, and you get that there. So. Do they get what you want? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite item that they got? Cheese dip. I like that cheese dip, too. The family went home with nearly $4,200 worth of groceries. And they paid $3,000 for the uh, bid. That money goes toward medical research at Golisano Children's Hospital. They, they really did a good thing there. Yeah. Well, a new era begins in Buffalo. Sports director Robin Nguyen tells us the Sabres will introduce their new owner, Terry Pagula, tomorrow. We'll be right back. Terry Pagula will be introduced as a new owner of the Buffalo Sabres tomorrow. The Pennsylvania billionaire's purchase of the team from Tom Golisano was unanimously approved by the NHL Board of Governors on Friday. Pagula agreed to pay $189 million to buy the team. An 11 o'clock news conference is scheduled for tomorrow morning. NHL Commissioner Gary Bettman will also be there. The Emmerichs played a rare Monday afternoon game in Hamilton and won 4-3 in a shootout. Mark Collins scored the game winner and Mikel Repic had two goals. Rochester is back at the War Memorial Wednesday night against Manitoba. The Syracuse Orange are hoping for some payback. SU is in Philadelphia tonight to face Villanova. Syracuse lost to Villanova during the four-game losing streak last month. Syracuse remains at 17 in the AP men's basketball poll after back-to-back -back wins over unranked teams, including an overtime victory against Rutgers on Saturday. Tip-off 7 o'clock tonight. And the Razor Sharks are home tonight. They won back-to-back -back road games and will start a seven-game homestand. The R Sharks face the defending league champion Lawton Fort Sill Calvary. Tip time there is 7.05. Go Sharks. Yes. We thank you for watching. The NBC Nightly News is next, followed by Rock City tonight. I'll see you back here at 11. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.